I'm Diane Burley, Chief Storyteller here at Coveo, and this is the Ecom Edge, a space where e-commerce experts, practitioners, and strategists hold illuminating discussions about their approaches to scaling and gaining advocates in a landscape dominated by retail giants like Amazon and, of course, demanding shoppers. And I'm thrilled to have my colleague, Chiro Greco, VP of AI here at Coveo. We're going to dig into this notion of one-to-one personalization and determine if it's fact or fiction. But before we get into the topic, I wanted to say a few things about Chiro. He's one of those people who is wicked smart and whom you know will always give an honest answer and certainly has made my life easier since I joined Coveo a year ago. Chiro, welcome. How are you today? Thank you for having me. I'm very good. Thank you. This is fun. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's get this going. About myself. Um, all right. So, but as you said, I'm the VP of AI at Coveo. I joined a, a little longer than a couple of years ago. Um, uh, it's been a kind of a bumpy road to get here, um, where I am. But um, yeah, I worked a lot on natural language processing mostly. And before this, I um, found myself in the strange position of being an entrepreneur. So I founded a company back in 2017 in San Francisco. That was called Tuso. And Tuso was doing natural language processing and artificial intelligence for search engines, specifically for e-commerce. And then we landed in San Francisco, we raised around, we got our clients, we built the product, and then uh, we went back iterating on the product three times. And on the third time, we went out to find commercial partners. And uh, so we started doing a bunch of partnerships with uh, other companies. And one of them was Cabell. And so that sort of led quite quickly to a conversation that was about acquisition as Cabell was starting to get serious about e-commerce and uh, they really liked uh, what what we had. Um, and uh, we liked Cabell and we liked what, what they were, you know, like offering us in terms of like, there was like an entire green field of, of in terms of line of business. And uh, so we joined Coveo through the acquisition of Tuso in 2019. Well, you skipped a few steps here, uh, which I'm going to fill people in. So you have a philosophy degree and then, and then you, you jumped into neuroscience. So how'd you make that jump? What, what led to the other? So, okay. So, cause I'm not sure like what you think of philosophy kind of depends on where you are in the world. In, in the United States, philosophy has a lot to do with like logic, science, and uh, cognitive sciences. I was lucky enough to be, like, I was in Italy back in the days, and um, um, that's where I'm from. And uh, I started working on language while I was doing my, while I was studying philosophy. Um, basically, I was actually doing like generative grammar. So things that are very theoretical and about like, how you represent the structure of languages, how you account for the fact that kids learn languages very quickly and languages are very uh, different one from another superficially, but something must be, um, there must be some some common, you know, structure that allows for all languages to be learned by every kid in the world, no matter where they are, no matter what the language is. So I was doing that kind of stuff. So I ended up doing neuroscience because at a certain point I felt like, all right, so I want to see how this works like in a real lab. And uh, how do you do experiments and things like that? Um, and th- that's how I ended up working in, in, in neuroscience. That's, I got my PhD in that. I, I read somewhere that you loved th- the, the theoretical, but then you really wanted to see it applied. And that's really what pushed you over into starting to sew. Is that, is that correct? That came later. And it, like, it was a bit frustrating in the sense that, okay, so the point is that your job market when you're an academic is might or might not be good. It really depends. Like if you are doing something at the intersection of psychology and formal linguistics, there are not many jobs around. So I was at the time in Belgium working as a postdoctoral fellow at Ghent University. And I had a bunch of colleagues that were like super smart and they knew a bunch of things about how languages work and are structured and so on. And I, was kind of trying to say, guys, like there's a whole bunch of people out there that really would like to hear from you and, and know what, you know, 
and uh, and but it, it wasn't exactly easy for me to communicate that in where I was with the people that I, that I was working with at the time. So I started working with Jacopo, who is my co-founder too. So and who also is a, a coherence director of artificial intelligence, like su supremely brilliant guy. And we started working on okay, so there must be something about what we know that can be applied. And the first thing we we we, we looked into is. Uh, why are search engines so dumb? If, well, with the exception, you know, of the very cool search engines, like generally search engines, like, uh, you know, Google and Bing. Yeah. And like, well, and now Coveo. But like, but our, our, our pitch at the time was, okay, so if you search for something on Google or you search for something on Amazon or you search for something on Bing, things are, are reasonably okay. And then the moment you kind of leave those, those safe places, search engines are still kind of clunky. And the thing that we really didn't like is that they kind of force a human being to bend, you know, their minds into thinking like the search engine, because you know the search engine is not going to get what you want. And so you're thinking keywords. And like from more kind of philosophical point of view, what we wanted to do is to kind of bridge this gap between machines and interfaces and people so under the you know the assumption that you know a machine should think like a human as much as possible not the other way around right so then you you went from italy to the states you started off in san francisco now you're in new york and you've got that great view out your window uh what what brought you to new york and, and oh you, Coveo. Coveo. to new york well you know, to New York, there's, there's New York, of course, because it's New York, uh, and Coveo. We were back in San Francisco. We were in San Francisco uh, when when we were working uh, at Tuso. Uh, we wanted to do this in the United States because we felt that this we're like the most exciting scene for tech. Um, so we went out and looked for investors, and we found some investors in California. So we basically packed our stuff and went there. Um, yeah, and then when Coveo acquired us. As you know, like most of the operations from a technical and our standpoint, the research and development department are based in, in Montreal and Quebec. So New York was a way to get closer to that. And I used to take a flight like every month uh, to, to spend an entire week in, in Montreal. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and uh, all of that uh, yeah, went bananas. So I thought you were going to tell me you moved to New York because they have great break dancing and you're really excellent at that. Oh, break dancing, you said? <laughs> I'm too old for that, but it's true. I used to be a break dancer. I was pretty good, actually. Yeah, but you believe so, it or not. So it started like in a, in a small town in the south of Italy. And there weren't many break dancers. Yeah, it was actually <laughs> Pop lock or were you guys. spinning on your head? With What kind of break dancer were you? I can't. Oh, yeah, I can definitely spin on my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was it, like, I was uh, 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 what is technically... Uh, uh, named a, a stylers or food workers. So it's like not much into power moves, but like doing your own thing and creating your style and stuff like that. So now that you're doing your own thing and creating your own style here, Kavir, let's dive into personalization and this this notion of one-to-one. -one. Um, I, we're... I hoped it was about breakdancing. Like the whole <laughs> that would have been <laughs> awesome. Would... We'll do that the next time. Um, so like, well, let's explore what's even possible in a digital con uh, context. First of all, let's set it straight. We're not talking about putting your name on an email or saying, welcome, Chiro, you're back. Um, so that's what it's not. So how do you define personalization? Well, a little bit, it's also like that, right? Like it's a ladder. So you start with things that are like reasonably easy and then you become more and more, you know, sophisticated in doing that. Uh, I guess like the I'm not sure how to define that in general. I can say that there, so for a number of reasons that really don't have anything to do with what you do for a living if you are like an e-commerce player or a retailer, but most kind of a planetary thing, uh, some companies ended up being very good at monetizing business models that are based on big data. And, and they became like very ubiquitous in our lives, right? So uh, we rely on them for pretty much everything right now that means that uh, you're kind of used to that personal touch that is is 
it comes from different directions, right? Like they kind of Google knows where I live. So, and somehow knows my habits. I, uh, I have a new dog and, uh, magically now I have all kind of ads and stuff like that about dogs. I never told anybody that I got a dog. They just inferred that from me Googling, like, how do you train your dog and things like that. So new things that happened for the first time in my personal profile problem. So the point is that users are very used to that. And, uh, and there's, there's, there's really a huge gap between what a, a, a gigantic tech company can do and everybody else can do. And uh, I guess that part of what we do at Coveo and, and, and I think in general where we should be, you know, aiming at is to bridge that gap as much as possible. I think a lot of re- uh, retailers uh, try and start off with the, the idea of targeting personas. You know, you're a dude in, in New York and you're probably like this. And so they think of personalization right. like that. And so you're trying to do it with rules and so on, but that only lasts for so long, especially when you've got somebody like, a you know, the big dudes like Amazon uh, doing exactly what you just said, picking up on the fact that you've got this little schnauzer running around oh yeah well okay so there's nothing wrong with the personas it's it's just a way of conceptualizing the problem uh there there might be something wrong well not wrong but like so rules only go we're you know it's the rules mostly that that i think at a certain point are uh, show some shortcomings right uh, so here's, I think, is where kind of machine learning and the advances in machine learning uh, come into the picture. It's because machine learning, I know that there's a lot of narrative around AI and so on, but what it actually is, is just a number of techniques that help us program machines that don't really need to be programmed uh, down to the little detail. And so they can learn how to fit a function. They can learn how to 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 optimize towards a certain goal, and if the goal is to you know uh, increase the the probability that a person clicks on an email that you sent after they they were on your website, or if the goal is to have people to spend more time on your e-commerce website or have them to uh, buy more on your website, you got that's you kind of you don't have to teach that algorithm everything you can just kind of give the algorithm data and tell the algorithm okay i want you to maximize this kpi and this like this is kind of like this data plus machine learning has been incredibly effective in in all the scenarios where you have tons of data and you have good algorithms so i think like the personas are they kind of make sense also because it's a way for merchandising and people who really know the business to pour their knowledge into a formal framework. But then there's a limit to what you can achieve with that just because you, you will be endlessly twitching your rules. And you, you can have both or you can have, a, you can have a combination of both or you can have. But for certain things, that machine learning is much more effective. Now, it also has a problem that sometimes like it is effective, but it's not really clear what it's doing. Mm-hmm. So it's a double-edged sword. Right. I read one, you, you referred to it as data greediness, this idea that, um, you know, you need so much data. You've, you've said it a couple of times, uh, big data. You need so much data. And that really is a problem when you're a, a smaller retail, when you're a, not an Amazon-sized company, let's put it that way, because we, th- we think small retailers, we're not talking about the boutique down the street. You're talking about the, even the big chains. They're, they oh, yeah. really don't have that much data. So go into that a little bit. But it kind of do so. Okay, so so the, here's a way in which we can describe like the big data problem, the thing. Uh, what we what we ended up discovering is that deep learning plus an unreasonable amount of data can be ridiculously effective. It's not that you need that to to get anything out of it, but the more data you have, the more you can solve complicated problems. Um, and sometimes like there are problems that we thought required a lot of structure and intelligence and so on. And it turned out that you can kind of brute force your way out of that if you have enough data. So e-commerce is a reasonably data intensive, 
uh, industry. So a, a medium-sized e-commerce website still generates like a, a, a reasonable mm-hmm. amount of data points. It's not, it's, th- there's something to chew on. The, but it's not, it's, it's not in the same ballpark. That's the point. So I think that retailers do have a reasonable amount of data it's the lack of focus on solutions for this scale and they're really tailored around the constraints that they have to face that is what is 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 that is the real focus here like you can't do cool stuff with the data of 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 a medium-sized retailer The, the point is that like if you're trying to apply the same things that that amazon does to that problem you might end up not getting what you want, or even worse, like you, the point is that it might not even make sense to do that. So we talk about personalization again. So many cost, so many retailers are saying they're having difficulty attaining it. Uh, customers are saying it's just not happening. So what do you attribute it to? Well, it depends on what you want to do. But like, if we're talking about like the personalization during your browsing process, uh, that's a case where I think like the constraints are the, the most important piece. And if we don't keep them in mind, then we cannot really walk backward towards a solution. Uh, so, okay, so let's put it this way. So there are like area, like verticals or industries where, for instance, you see your clients coming back on your store so many times and uh, dog food, right? Like cause my dog is going to eat tomorrow as well. There's nothing you can do about it. And, uh, and or grocers and things like that. And then there are like other areas where things are not the same. Like even for big guys, like booking.com, right? How many times can you book like your vacations? Like twice a year, something like that. So there's a combination of like how often I see people coming back on the website and how easy it is for me, the retailer, to identify that person um, uh, deterministically. So saying just like, oh, here's Diane. Uh, uh, oh, I know her. Like she, she, she came in my shop like several times. That's what she likes. And, and this in B2C e-commerce, in our, like in my experience, practically never happens. <laughs> it's like most of retailers don't have that kind of, 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 of scenario. Uh, their users don't log in. They don't leave their names or, or they can, but then you're limited, like, because like you, you have their names because at a certain point they checked out, but it does not mean that then you can use that information to efficiently recognize them when they just like land on your website without logging in in six months from now. Right. The cookie expired or, or now you've got regulators saying that the cookies have to expire. Yeah, but even if, it, first of all, yes. And, it, but even if it didn't, like. Is the cookie identifying this person with a with a with a right. name? Not really. Right? right. So yeah. So stitching those two pieces of information is complicated. So I think there are like other ways of doing that. Because this is definitely I, I think I hope this is very clear. Like this is definitely not a problem that Amazon has. Because I keep going back and I am always constantly logged in. Not only on Amazon.com, I'm logged in on Amazon Prime. They know what movies I watch. They, you know, like I, I check out at, at Whole Foods. They knew like, you were going to get a dog before you knew you were going to get a dog. In this case, yes, <laughs> in my life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, we ca- you, you've been terming this a, a cold start shopper. The idea that someone comes to your shop for the first time what can you learn about them? And, that, and that's actually been a fair amount of research that you and your team have been working on. Um, you're widely published. Maybe you can go into that a little bit. Talk about oh, yeah. what uh, okay, drew so you into that. The, okay, so cold start is, I think, is a sub problem of this more general problem of how do you infer intention from a user that you might not be able to recognize or immediately. So cold start is the harshest version of this problem. It's the problem where, like, I really don't know who this person is. And by the way, cold start is twofold. So you have cold start problem with users you don't know, and you have a cold start for items mm-hmm. um, that, that were never in your inventory before. Um, it's Generally speaking, it's just a problem of I have a new object in my model 
whether how can it's it be user. the most popular when it's brand new, right? Exactly, exactly. So like it might be, you know, like a user or a, a thing that I sell, like a product. But the point is like, I don't have data about this person or this item. So what do I do now? Um, so in that case, like you can go for wisdom of the crowd, uh, which I guess is what most, uh, you know, retailers do. Um, but that has some serious shortcomings as far as items are concerned, because it actually risks to bury the items even further down. Um, and uh, so in general, the cold start problem, I think it's a good way to address that. There, there's a variety of techniques, but like in the, in the use cases that we deal with, a good way to deal with that is to find ways to create a map, like a way, a model, a way to kind of interpret the actions of a user or the actions that users um, take with respect to products based on the actions that a user undertakes within the same session. And, and we can cluster them together. It doesn't have to be about one user. We can have like kind of a, a general map about what people do on the website and then it becomes a matter of transferring that knowledge from things that are close enough um, from, you know, to, to, to kind of have an educated guess about this brand new thing that I have, whether it's a user or, or And you can do product. this from just one instance with your, with your customer one through one session. It depends on the session, of course, like, as I said, like, these are mostly like mashups of data. So it's, it's really not about like your single session, but it has to be effective within your single session. So if we want to do like dive a little bit into how that works, it, it's basically so you can't consider sessions as just like a sequences of uh, sequences of pages that, that the users uh, you know view, uh, view, and then you can you can then create a a, a, a vector space. So you can create like a, a a way to represent those things, those sessions in terms of similarities of of latent dimensions in the data you don't need to know those in advance it's a, it's it's your machine learning uh technique um that needs to figure out what's closer to what and but if you do your job properly you end up having like a, a conceptual representation of what people do on your website that says basically that hey um you know uh, let's say that you sell you know clothes and and, and, and clothing and and uh, items and you have it should say something like sneakers are closer to boots than, uh, you know, shirts. Right. It's, it's actually almost mapping like a physical department store where you would see products clumped together based on similarity, right? Right. But instead of doing, the point is that instead of doing that a priori, so mm -hmm. instead of saying just like, this is how I'm going to organize my department store, you kind of let users roam free on your website collect the data and then you say okay so that's what I what I this is the pattern that I see emerging and of course like if you infer your pattern right it should at a certain level match the kind of department store organization like it cannot be nuts right, right. like it has to match our well, does this help solve the the a perpetual problem of um, unlabeled data or badly labeled data in in our business we don't really label data because what we 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 kind of work under the assumption of kind of this pseudo labeling situation where my label is an action that a user undertakes right. spontaneously on the website. And I can never assume uh, reasonably that that action is wrong in the same sense as a label is wrong. Like this is an image of a cat and has been mislabeled as an image of a dog. There's, there's no such a thing for us. But the, the crucial point is that once you start having your representation of how things are similar one to another, and it can really be about user behavior, and you can add other dimensions. It can right. be images. It can be the text that is in the descriptions. It can be all of the above. I was just going to ask, what kind of data are you talking about? Maybe you can list off some of it, because for a lot of people, they're not really aware of being able to unify so many disparate types of data. So in our case, we uh, we willingly chose to be as light touch as possible okay. because we're a B two B 
company. So we don't want to have like a, a complicated data engagement with our clients. We we want them to be able to use these this this this, this these technologies um, fast and and clean. So we're talking about data that they pretty much already have. Um, so it's the catalog, which we need anyway, because like one of the things that Coveo does is provide a search engine. So if we don't have the catalog, there's nothing to search on. So that's a no brainer. And whatever it's in the catalog, which is also a very non-sensitive piece of information as it is conceived to be something that is going to be publicly on, on, the, on the website anyhow. And then we're talking about behavioral data. The behavioral data we talk about is what people do on the website. So where they click on, the pages that they view, the products that they view, the, of course, the products that they add to cart, remove from cart, and ultimately buy. Mm -hmm. Now, those data are usually data that are already tracked by the e-commerce manager, like by the e-commerce folks and, and within the organization of my clients. Because like they, they have to keep track of what, what happens on their website anyway, right? So it's it's really like that. And we don't want to identify people uh like by name, we don't we don't want to do anything like that because as I said, it ends up being kind of useless for the type of services that we provide. So what we want to do is use that data to create to understand what happens there. And then what is going to happen is that when I see a new person coming on a website, it might be new, might be might not be new. Like it, it depends. Like when I see a new user coming on a website, and then I wait for the user to do something. To click on something, to search for something, to to you know, just take some actions. Then my job is to map those actions as fast as possible to the space to the to the map that I created using the data of other people, of other users. If we can do that efficiently, what we should be able to see is that even if the user is 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 uh, you know a new user, so it's a it's a it's a legitimately a cold start problem we can make it not that cold like warmer right, so in right. a couple of clicks we can go it's like oh i know where this guy's going because i've seen so many people going in a direction i've seen so many products being clustered together by the behavior of others so people. you're weighing both you're weighing the individual session what you're seeing real time as well as the wisdom of the crowd what people have absolutely done yeah, okay. the individual session is is what i need to condition on is is what i i need to take that into consideration because that gives me the context that I have to act upon. Mm -hmm. But in that section, by the way, that session then is going to become part of my space, part of my map, right? But during your engagement with the website, what we're going to do is try to put you on a map that I already built using the, the behavior of the people. It's, it's an in, so very intuitively is like, if you don't have a map, it's really hard to understand what a person is doing, right? So if you don't have any frame of reference, it's hard to understand whether people are doing one thing or another and try to infer their intention. So if your map is accurate, uh, the, the more accurate your map is, the better you are at predicting and inferring the, 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 the intent of the user. Where do you see permission-based personalization going? Is that going to be something that, especially as regulators are getting involved, is that going to have a huge impact or not so much? No, wait, define, define permission-based. What would you ask where the retailer is asking you, uh, you know, what you're interested in, cookies and so on, and you're weighing in on different different items. I, I guess there's, there is a lot of different aspects to that. So wait, so there are like, like a number of things there. Like, okay, so one is, would you like to be tracked? And that is the kind of the accept all the cookies banner that, that you have to uh, to agree or or or, or not. Um, I guess that, yeah, I mean that that's part of the game. There's 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 it really depends on what the users want to do. Users are not they're not super protective of their data in that sense. So they're okay with you, and I mean, until you, you shouldn't do any shady stuff. But they're okay; they understand that that's part of of their experience. Then there's a different thing that is the retailer asking explicitly something like, "Hey, what are your favorite brands?" or "Hey, would you like to you know uh, 
be in touch with us. So, and it's okay if we if we if we're in touch with you and send you like a couple of emails every once in a while and so on. So that's it's kind of a different story, and that I think is super important in creating the personas that you were talking about before, and also like to create like the the right data to build personas upon. But it also has to do with how good the retailer is in creating a fiduciary relationship with their users and products like SaaS, like the products are just like one piece in a much more articulated puzzle. Of course, at the end of the day, you need like a good tool that takes those data and, 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 and put them to good use. But how you're going to harvest the data, how you're going to convince people to be okay with willingly telling you, oh, this is my favorite brands and, or this is uh, the, the favorite stuff that I want to do in life. So that is really about, it's, it's a combination of factors. Like, is your user experience annoying, for instance? Like, are people going just like, I, I, I hate this pop-up, just like, God damn it. right? First of all, and, or, and do they feel that there's value in sharing this information with you as a brand or as a retailer. Do you start to to weigh and you know, like a good lawyer, I should know the gist of the answer you're going to give me, but I have no idea. Um, do you start to weigh the number of uh, products that a person has explored? I mean, I'm looking at area rugs right now, so I'm knee deep in area rugs and going through and does my, does my behavior change? Do you, does the model change when you see somebody hits a certain threshold? Like they've now looked at their 300th area rug. So their behavior is going to do something slightly different than people who are down to one or two. Look, yeah, exactly. So in general, of course, so there, there's, there's, there, you want to, you want to keep track of what is consistent behavior. You want to keep track with behavior that is unusual but consistent enough to be very informative back to my dog example. So I've never looked at dogs before. So now I start looking at dogs, but it's not like I randomly open one page about dogs once I kind of looked about, you know, kind of looked on stuff for do about dogs for like a, an entire week. And so that is, seems to be informative because it's like, I think it's getting a dog. <laughs> like, or at least like is seriously considering um to, or uh, building a case not to have one <laughs> or building a, exactly like but anyway like yeah we can help this person whatever, <laughs> whatever he's trying to do it, it's about not having a dog uh but yeah so but in our job at Coveo, this is the point there's there's a huge difference in being a in owning your own cycle and being a B2B company. This is a huge, huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Because like in one case, uh, you you really you you want to listen to your customer base. And depending on how big you are and depending on how, how widespread your reach is and, and depending also on how wide your, your inventory is. Like are you the kind of retailer like Walmart where you can find everything? Um, these are the kind of questions you want to ask yourself. Like, oh, there's users that I kind of know and they're starting to look for something that is very different or or consistently looking in this moment of, of, of the year about this. And there are also other things you can infer, right? Like there are also kind of environmental hints, like being in Montreal where it's like freaking cold during the winter as opposed to just like Copacabana, right? So, but for us, what we need is something that is flexible and robust enough to handle all these cases because we don't really own one big e-commerce website. We provide services for a number of websites that are very different one from another. They vary in size, they vary in industry, they vary in uh, size of inventory, uh, geographical area, language. So there's there's a lot of that. So there's a huge difference in being a B2B provider here. And this is part of what we've done. Like Jacopo from my team, like he did an amazing job at this. And he worked a lot on on 
we worked a lot, but like he, he felt like particularly strongly about this, like in putting on the map of like general research for e-commerce technology, the problems that that a, pro, a B2B provider such as Coveo uh, has, because they are naturally overlooked because the-, the They're small. There's, it's not that they're small, there's few of them. Right. And the, the super big guys are like zero, zero trillion dollar company is like that in e-commerce. Like the trillion dollar companies are huge websites are like Alibaba or like Amazon. They have one website and, and that's where everything has to happen. And massive amounts of data scientists massive too. So the yeah. and compute, also compute power incentives. and data. So it's the trifecta of everything. Super different incentives, right? Because right? right. like if you have like your recommender system being like 0.1 more accurate on Amazon, well, that can be a serious amount of money. So it's an optimization that is worth doing maybe mm -hmm. at the scale. But should I pursue the same goal if I am providing a recommender system to clients such as the clients that Caveo serve? Mm -hmm. well, maybe not because like 0.1% improvement in, on, on, on a website that makes $100 million only on the conversion rates about the recommender system might not be worth the headache. And they there are other problems that they have that are much more important that we should be focusing on those. So what should retailers look for in, in, a, in a personalization system? There's, everybody says they have a personalization system. And to me, I always wonder, how can you have 40 personalization point solutions all working with their own data and not uh, really talking to each uh, other? That's the holy grail. Like every, <laughs> yeah, like everybody wants to have like one single personalization for everything. Um, but it's, well, it depends on what you want to do. Um, you should be aiming at something that increases your KPIs and you should have your KPIs very clear in mind. And you should be able to articulate, like, you should be aware of what the constraints are. So if your personalization engine is about Getting in touch with your audience through an email marketing tool is a very different job than the one that I just described about do you want your website to be personalized in terms of experience, even for um, unregistered, like anonymous users. That kind of depends, like, you know, like it really depends on you. If you're a grocery store, you might say, I don't mind because like most of my users are logged in and they're going to come back next week. And they're doing so, reorders and you can sort of right, figure so out I, a cadence on that. I might have another, another need here. I might need something that helps me with promoting uh, products that are in, in, in my long tail. Right. It, it's super, it, it's absolutely legitimate. It really depends. But if you are a do it yourself retailer, um, and 90% of, of your users will be anonymous and they will sort of come back, right? Like twice a year, three times a year, something like that. Do you think that that would help? And if yes, let's agree upon the KPIs. So if this works well, you should see KPIs going up or down. Some of these KPIs are very clear to interpret, like conversion rate and or average order value. So there are like KPIs that are in almost a causal relationship mm -hmm. with what you do on the website. And then once we, we nail those, we can start talking about more indirect KPIs. Like, are you interested in understanding whether your personalization strategy for anonymous users has improved the experience on your website to the point that you think it can help people be more willing to log in. And the moment they log in, now a, 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 you know, a new world opens up, the world of user profile and personas and segmentations and plugging your email marketing into your website. It's, it's, as I said, it's a ladder. We're, we're running uh, long, <laughs> as we always do when we speak. <laughs> Um, but where, where, where are you going next with your research? You, you always like to, I've noticed a pattern here. You like to do research that impacts and solves business problems. It's not to do research for research sake. So where do you want to go next? 
Oh, I just that's because like I'm I'm not nearly as good as as the people who do like real research. So that's that's the thing. Like I cannot really contribute to to really theoretical things because I'm not smart <laughs> enough. Uh, no, it's the guy with the PhD. So uh, I don't know. Like right now, what we're really interested in is understanding how much of this personalization the piece of the personalization is is a way to deliver something that that people need and keep an eye on keeping check also what they believe they need like whether that's true or not because that's also something that we don't really take for granted like sometimes like you might think that you really need that and then you you try it out and you goes like you know kpis are not really going up or or down the way we want it to so you might not need this that much. Which brings us to the next topic that we're really interested in, that is um, experimentation. So the next step, of course, so in a scenario where personalization is important because it creates like this this beautifully crafted uh, uh, user experience around what you want, what you want to do, then there's a component of understanding if what we did is the right thing. And if we have a better idea, how do we test it? How do we make sure that the next thing that we that, that came to our mind is really helpful? And sometimes you cannot wait a product release to do that. Or sometimes you cannot, like, you should be more comfortable with the idea of A-B testing a lot. Um, so that's what we're, we're very interested in right now. All right. So next time you come back, we're going to talk about experimentation, A-B testing, and QAing all your ideas. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. This has been great. I've always, Thank you. Always enjoy talking to you. Thank you for listening. To hear more, subscribe to the Ecom Edge podcast today. Listen to us wherever you get your podcasts.